Hey friends, thanks for clicking on our YouTube video. I just got done preaching in between guilt and grace. I hope it blesses you, encourages you. We do this every single week. We have in-person and online services at 9 and 10.30. So if you do enjoy it, man, get some friends, get some family, gather around and join us again next week. Also, uh, if you would consider following us on social media, all the links are going to be in the video description and give us a follow. We're always wanting to encourage you and bless your life. Finally, uh, if this does bless you and encourages you, I hope that you would consider partnering with us financially. Uh, really, all of this happens because of the generosity of people just like you. No matter what amount you can give, uh, the fact that you're generous is amazing. There's a link in this video description you can follow. Again, I hope it blesses you, encourages you, speaks to you every day, not just your someday. Uh, I love you, and we'll see you next week. This week, we are finishing our series uh, on the in-between, uh, talking about how at times in life, we find ourselves in one place, wanting to be in another place and caught in between. Uh, we're kind of living that right now where we're not in quarantine, but we're not all the way out yet either. We're in this kind of weird in between. And, uh, and if you missed any of this series, I would encourage you, go back on our YouTube and take a look at those because I know God will speak to you. Uh, we covered a lot of great things. Um, for all the dads in the house and men, we covered in between a position of leadership and actually possessing leadership. And that's a great one you can go back and listen to. Or in between hurt and healing. Uh, how many of you guys, we pick up hurts in life and sometimes we live in between that hurt and that healing. And I know this morning is going to be another great message to speak to us again. Well, if you do have your Bibles, I'm going to go straight to God's Word. If you hang around us long enough, you know we're Jesus people. And really the mission of our house is to help you take a step closer to Jesus. It's that simple and that profound. So whether this morning it may be your first step, your 40th step, or your 900th step, we know this, we all have another step to be closer and closer to Jesus, which means this, it's not about perfection, because nobody here is perfect, it's all about progression. Can I get an amen? All right, well, John, y'all got to preach with me this morning. I like an energetic, talk back, preach with me church. If y'all don't know how to do that, just say amen anytime you hear something good, right? That's... If I don't hear a lot, I'm going to, okay. All right, John, <laughs> John chapter 20, 21, verses 15 through 17. It's three verses. <clears throat> it says this, uh, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Verse 16, again, Jesus said, Simon, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, well, take care of my sheep. Verse 17, the third time he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things and you know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. This morning I would like to preach from the title, In Between Guilt and Grace. In Between Guilt and Grace. Let's pray. God, I pray that you speak to us this morning. God, I pray that you make your truth real and applicable, God, in our everyday situation. Lord, whether somebody is exploring faith, they don't know about faith yet. God, I pray that they're welcome in your house. And God, I pray that as someone who's fully engaged in faith, doing their best to look like you, Lord, I pray that you speak to them as well. And God, I pray that this message go beyond a room, into living rooms, under devices, into people's hearts, to see people take a step closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You see, guilt is something that we all deal with. You've dealt with it. I've dealt with it. No matter what uh, country or nation or family you were born into, no matter what the color of your skin is, no matter what demographic you come from, we all deal with guilt. We've all done something that we regret. Maybe not immediately, but eventually. 
Maybe you've been in that heated argument and you said that thing that at that moment you felt, but then you slept on it and you had to go back and go, hey, my bad. Maybe in a moment of weakness, you gave into temptation and you broke a relationship or you broke trust or you said something or you engaged in that conversation and you go, ah, why did I do that? We've all had moments where we have felt guilty. You know, and every person has a way of dealing with guilt, don't we? I mean, some deal with it differently. Some get angry. Some act like it's not there. Some try to overcompensate and do a lot of good things. And so they put the guilt things over here and the good things. And they go, oh, look, I know I did that wrong. But look how many good things I did. I can remember the first time that I felt guilt in a real visceral way. Like this was real. Um, was when I was maybe nine or ten years old. And I was at my grandparents' house, and we were chopping wood with an axe. And he was teaching me how to do that. And you, you had a big log, and you had a little log, and you would come down and try to split the wood. Well, he leaves me to my own devices, which is his first mistake. And uh, I'm there chopping wood, and I overshoot the log, and I snap the axe handle. Well, being nine or ten years old, uh, I thought I had just ruined the axe. Oh my goodness, it's, it's broken. I've just ruined this tool. My grandfather's going to be so mad at me. So not knowing that, you know, you can go buy an axe handle for like 10 bucks at a hardware store. I thought I've ruined this really expensive piece of equipment. He's going to be so mad at me. I'm in trouble. So I hid it behind the shed. And I thought, he'll never find it. It'll disappear. It'll be gone. Well, only a few days later, we're back at my grandparents. All the cousins are out there. And he gathers all of us around. And he goes, hey, um... Who broke my axe handle? Well, I'm the type, I'm going to deny till I die. It ain't me. You know, how many of you guys, you're cavers, like immediately, you're like, who broke? It was me. I'm sorry. I was not that, I was going to like, I'm going to go down to my grave denying it. He's in heaven right now, probably watching me going, oh, okay, it was you. Uh, Because I never told him. Uh, So, and then, you know, you know how sometimes parents or teachers or people in authority can kind of narrow it because they kind of have an idea of who broke it because I was the only one chopping wood. So he kind of starts generally and then he goes very like, are you sure you didn't? No, I didn't do a thing. I'm not giving up on that, right? And I remember immediately going, oh, this is wrong. I shouldn't be lying. I shouldn't be hiding. Um, I wasn't some super spiritual person. I was nine years old. Uh, But I knew I shouldn't be doing that. And later in the evening, as the day kind of quieted, I kind of feel, have you ever felt that like gnawing sensation, that pit in your stomach of, ah, this is not right. This is wrong. I I need to confess. Um, uh, Obviously, it didn't work because I didn't. Um, But... I remember thinking to myself and and believing that it'll go away eventually. Like, eventually I'll just forget it. Eventually it'll just fade into the background memories of my life and I'll just move on and everything will be all good. But that was nine when I was nine and now I'm 36 and I still remember it. And sometimes uh, we do that with guilt. We do the thing that we shouldn't do, and we don't want to deal with it, so we think we'll just, we'll just move on. Let's just, let's just move on with our life, and we'll figure, I don't have to say anything, I don't have to deal with it, I'll eventually just forget it, and everything will be all good, right? Anybody ever feel that way? Like, let's just, I don't want to have to talk about this, I don't want to have to go there, let's just move on. It's between you and me, Jesus, and if you don't believe in Jesus, it's between me and me. No one has to know. But we still feel that. We still feel that moment of, I think think guilt is kind of like these balloons. Not as cute, but kind of like these balloons. Guilt has a unique way of following you, doesn't it? Like no matter where you go, no matter what relationship you're in, guilt follows you. You ever feel that sensation of guilt? Oh, getting in my way. So whatever relationship we go into, we carry the guilt of our past relationship. Some of us, we feel guilty about it. Oh yeah, sorry, this was, uh, yeah, this was uh, my addiction and this is when I, you know, I said what I shouldn't have and that's when I had an affair. Uh, so, you know, and this is when I lied on my taxes and this is when I stole something from work. I mean, maybe you don't do those things, but you place your own things. So we walk into situations carrying our guilt. 
carrying our stuff. Now, we all deal with guilt, right, differently. Like I said, we all, some of us, we try to hide it. Like, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to mention it. We don't want to tell that part of our story. So we just try to cover it up. I'm like, no, there's nothing there. No, I, I've, ne- I've never been unfaithful. I am like the most faithful. I don't ever go to those websites. That's just not who I am. I am strictly a BibleGateway.com guy. Like, I don't go anywhere else. I don't do that. I've never even heard of a liquor store. What are you talking about? I don't, I've never been drunk in my life. I don't know, right? You know, so we try to like hide things. Some of us, we hide it and act like, oh, it's nothing there. Others of us, we dump it, right? We think if I could just, we, we don't want to deal with it, we want to dump it. There's a difference. So maybe we've wronged somebody or done something wrong to a friend or a spouse or in a relationship. And we feel guilty about it, so we want to confess it without dealing with it. So all we do is we take our balloons off and give it to them and then attach it to them. We're like, oh, I feel so much better about it. But now they're carrying our guilt. And they're like, wait, you just, you didn't deal with anything. You just dumped this on me. And then you go, oh, I feel so much better, don't you? No, I don't feel better. You just, you just told me something horrible. Anybody ever do? Anybody ever have anybody do that to you? Let's say that. Or we want to explain it away in a way that, like, what made us attract these balloons is like, yeah, that's totally normal. Yeah, well, you don't balloons. That it's, guilt is just part of it, part of the human condition. In fact, we want to explain it away so much that we want to rationalize and normalize certain behaviors as a way of like, yeah, that's like that's. This is the 21st century. Come on. Come on. Like, you're living in the 20th century. Oh, uh, you're living, like, God, that whole Bible stuff, like, that isn't, a, that's Old Testament. Like, I'm, I'm a New Testament, a new, new, New Testament person. I'm a new, my own version Testament person. Anybody ever meet somebody like that? Right. And see, the thing is, we all, we all kind of carry guilt. And sometimes we can carry it into church. And sometimes we can carry it into our families. Sometimes we can carry it into our kids, and so we don't want to deal with certain topics because we wear the balloons of the guilt that we have, and so we don't want to address certain things, and we don't want to deal with certain things, and, and what we end up doing is living in between. Living in between guilt and grace, and grace becomes like this fairy tale of like, oh, that's not even real. Like, there's no way I could truly be free from that. There's no way that I could truly let go. But can I tell you, church, this morning that we serve a God who can redeem you, set you free, forgive you, and put you back on the path of righteousness because he has the power to do that. He has mercy. He has grace. He has love. You see this, we all have guilt, but the problem is that we deal with our guilt. We tell ourselves, I'll figure it out. We tell ourselves, I'll, I'll hide it. I'll rationalize it. I'll figure out a way to deal with it, but it follows us. You see, guilt isn't necessarily always a bad thing. Sometimes guilt can be a good thing. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10, it says this, that godly sorrow, right? So godly guilt brings repentance. So there's moments when We'll first feel certain guilt and we'll go to God and God deals with it. God's able to restore. God's able to forgive. God's able to put us back on the right path. God's able to kind of go, okay, thank you for coming to me. But there's another way that says, but worldly sorrow or worldly guilt brings death. Now, what is, what is worldly sorrow? I think worldly sorrow is shame. I, I like to think of it like this, that that shame is guilt grown up. Shame is guilt fully matured. Shame is guilt that has taken root in your life and produced fruit called shame. Here's the difference, because you may not understand. The difference is that, that guilt says you did something bad. Shame says you are someone bad. You see the difference? Guilt says, you did this, you did something bad, let's correct it. Shame says, you are the bad person. You're the broken person. You'll always be like this. You are the bad thing. I think shame always tries to attach our activity to our identity, doesn't it? Shame tells us that we'll never change, we'll never rise above, we're always going to be this type of an individual. And so, you know, quit trying anyways. Because you're not going to be useful. No one can really love you. 
No one's going to trust you. No one's going to be able to use you. Like, no one's going to be able to kind of look at you and go, oh, man, what a woman or man of God. What a, what a good husband. What a good wife. What a good father. What a good mother. What a good employee. Because shame is telling you none of those things. Not that, not that simply I did something wrong, which we've all done, but you are the wrong thing. You're the screw-up. You're the failure. Not that you failed, you are the failure. And so anything you ever try to do will always end in failure because you are a failure. Every marriage you get into will be broken because you are broken. Every friendship that you try to have will fail because you're not a good friend. Anybody ever deal with shame? Anybody ever get stuck in the in-between between guilt and grace and this massive hurdle called shame is telling you, no, you didn't just do something bad. You are bad. You know what I love about Jesus? Jesus will tell us the truth, but will always point forward. Jesus always says, yeah, you did that bad. I'm going to tell you the truth. I, I, remember the woman who's, who's about to be stoned because she committed adultery? Maybe you don't know the story. And all the Pharisees and all the religious people, they've got their rocks and they're ready to kill her because she did something bad. And she could never do anything more than that bad thing. And they're all lined around her and they got the rocks ready, getting ready to hurl it. What does Jesus do? He comes in and he says, hey, if anybody's perfect, you throw the first rock. They all drop their rocks. What does the, Jesus says, Jesus says this, hey, 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 woman, you are forgiven. Go and sin no more. So, he, so he, he tells the woman the truth, but he also speaks to her future. You see, the reason I love Jesus so much is, is shame will always tell you you're not, you're a failure, you're broken. But Jesus will always speak into your potential and into your future. He will call you a son and a daughter before you ever behave like one. <laughs> before you ever act right. In fact, Romans says that while you were still a sinner, he went to the cross, meaning that they are still worthy of my love. Before you ever began to behave like that, shame says, no, 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 they don't deserve me. Grace says, even before they behave, I'm going to die for them. You see, you have an accuser. In Revelations 12, verse 10, it says this, For the accusers of our brother and sister, meaning this, that you have somebody in your life called the enemy, called the devil. And in many cultural, you may think, oh, Satan's not real. He is real, and he will constantly accuse you of what you will never be. Can you imagine having a passenger in your, in your seat every day on the wor- way to work, and they're just telling you, they're going to fire you. You can't, you're not, you don't deserve this job. <laughs> Once they find out that you're nothing but a failure, you're going to lose it. Maybe you're headed to the first date, and you're like, they don't really even, they're not interested in you. They just want a free meal. They're not going to call you back. You're a loser. You're not worth dating. That is what we have in our life. And that's what shame does. Can I tell you that every single day, you have two forces speaking into your life. You have the enemy, who's an accuser, telling you you'll never be. You're broken, reminding you of all your failures. Put your version of the axe handle story, and you'll never let you forget it. But on the other side, you have an advocate. The Holy Spirit, moving in your life telling you everything you are. You know, the beauty of Christ and God is God says, you pick. Who do you want to listen to? You can listen to the accuser or you can listen to the advocate. You can believe in death or you can believe in life. So many believers, we're stuck. We're stuck between guilt and grace because We allow shame to keep us halfway. We allow shame to kind of keep us from fully experiencing all that God has because we feel like all of our sin and all of our stuff just follows us. And so we might remain stuck. You see, the story we read uh, at the beginning was the story of Peter. And the story we we find here in John chapter 21 was was literally the last interaction Peter has with Jesus and his disciples before he goes to heaven. And the funny thing is, is this story actually happens after Jesus had died on the cross and rose from the dead. 
And so, so what I love about Peter is Peter is the type of guy who's always putting his foot in his mouth. Anybody relate with a Peter? Always doing the wrong thing, always screwing up, always messing up. In fact, if like I was one of the other disciples, I would watch what Peter does and do the opposite thing, right? Like that's a good policy. Okay, Peter does that. I'm not. Anybody ever feel like Peter? Like, man, even when I try, I still mess up. Even when I'm trying a good thing, I still screw up. Okay, I'm the only only Peter. You guys are all Johns. Praise God for that. You guys are all the good people. I'll just be Peter. Okay, cool. That's right. Work, works good for me. Peter's at the last dinner with Jesus. And to set this story up, um, Jesus is telling his disciples, hey, listen, you guys are all going to abandon me in a moment of difficulty. Peter, big chested. Not me, Jesus. Not me. I'm ride or die. I'll be with you to the end. I'll go to prison for you. I'll go to battle for you. How many of you guys got those friends that like talk a big game and then when you need them, you're like, where you at? And funny thing is, Jesus goes, Peter, Peter, Peter. (laughs) Listen, man. You know, actually before, before the dawn comes, this is an evening meal. Before the dawn comes, you're gonna deny me three times. I think as humans, we would look at Peter's passion and be like, no way, not that dude. Not him. Like Peter's, he's amped. He's good. Like maybe, maybe Bartholomew. That's a bad guy. He'll deny. Not Peter. But actually, if you read in Scripture, you see that Peter denied Jesus three times. In fact, <laughs> it says here in Luke chapter 22, verse 61, this is the th- right after Peter denies him for the third time. It says, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the words the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows, before dawn, you will disown me three times. This is like the ultimate pronouncement of guilt. When Jesus literally looks you in the eye. Like think about your worst moment. Think about your worst mistake and then looking up from it and Jesus is like, oh, cool. When I grew up in church, um, the older I got, the less I wanted to sit with my parents. Uh, So I was a teenager. I wanted to, like, sit in another part of the church where I could do my own thing, you know. Like, I don't want to sit with mom and dad. Um, And we used to have church all the time. So we had, like, morning church. We had night church. We had Wednesday night church. We had revival church. How many of you guys had revival church? It was, like, literally every day of the week. You're like, listen, I've been saved Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I need Friday off. Nope, i got to get saved again. Friday, here we go again. Let's do it. All right. Cool. Saturday prayer. Saturday. I mean, dear Lord, Jesus, come on, man. Like, and so I had, to, I had to, like, do my thing a little once in a while. And so, you know, we're at church, and I'd be misbehaving, you know, not listening to the preacher. None of y'all do that. Y'all are all locked in. I praise God for that. Y'all don't even look at your phones. Praise Jesus. Uh, and I, do you have a parent or a mom or dad like this, that when you were doing something wrong, all they had to do was look at you? Like, and you, ca- you caught eyes with them, and it was like a death sentence. You knew the minute you got home, it was over, right? So, like, I'd be all the way across the church. I'm cutting up. I'm not listening. And my mom or dad, they'd look at me, and I'd just be, like, enjoying my life, living my life, you know? And then all of a sudden I catch eyes, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm dead, right? <laughs> I wonder if, Jesus, if Peter's in this moment. He's like, no, nah, I don't know Jesus. Oh, <laughs> shoot, I'm found out. Scripture says that he went away and wept bitterly. Isn't it funny that, we're going to look at this in just a minute, that that Peter denies Jesus. And then the next time we see them interacting, Jesus is making a meal for Peter. You see, I think this, that Jesus is the bridge from guilt to grace. Jesus is the only way that we can find ourselves moving from guilt to grace to overcome shame. There's no way of talking yourself out of the shame and out of the guilt. The only way you can do it is by by living your life fully committed, fully involved in Jesus. You see, Jesus is the bridge bridge from wherever the here is in your life to the there is. If I could sum up this series, the in-between is found in Jesus. He was the bridge from life to death. He's the bridge from hurt to healing. He's the bridge from distraction to purpose. He's the bridge that helps us overcome guilt into grace. It's found in Jesus. 
The good news of Jesus is that he helps us move from where we find ourselves into the life that he has designed for us. So what's so special about Jesus? Got a few observations for you this morning as we close. Number one is this, is that grace will always find you. Grace has a way of finding you in your darkest moment. Grace has a way of finding you when you run away. I love that Peter, Peter, in the first moment before the death of Jesus, he, he looks at Jesus as he denies him for the third time and he runs away and weeps bitterly. How many of you guys have ever, have ever failed in life and the last thing you want to do is come to church? The last thing you want to do is pray. Come on, how many of you ever been there? You do something wrong and you think, I should pray. No, I ain't praying. Jesus ain't listening to me right now. I'm not going, I hear it all the time when I invite people to church. Like, you should come to church. Like, dude, I can't come to church. Not yet. i got to get some things right. But grace will find you. In fact, in, in John chapter 21, verse 1, it says that afterwards Jesus appeared to his disciples. So Jesus came to his disciples. Jesus found his disciples fishing. He found all the men who had abandoned him. Jesus went and found them. How many of you guys have ever been wronged and you're like, I'm not going to them first, they're coming to me. <laughs> If you expect me to call you after what you did to me, not happening. Come on, if you've been married, you know what's going on, right? Like, you can't sit in the living room and her in the bedroom and expect things to just get fixed because she ain't coming to you, brother. You got to go in and be like, hey, so listen, I, I think someone may be at fault. I'm not sure who it is, but let's talk about it. And maybe we'll discover really who's the root, you know, like, felt like you said some things and if you would mind, I'll, I'll apologize. You know? <laughs> but Jesus comes to the people who denied. Can I tell you that no, how far, no matter how far you run, it may be months, it may be years, it may be a decade, can I, can I tell you that grace will find you and the good news of Jesus will find you. And if those of you who have run from Jesus, you can look back on your life and go, that was Jesus. That was Jesus. He was interrupting my life. Grace was interjecting into my guilt. Grace was interjecting and interrupting shame to tell me how much he loves me. Can I tell you that grace will always find you? Grace finds you in your darkest moment. Grace finds you in your worst moment. And shame will always tell you that you don't deserve Jesus, but grace will say, I will come for you no matter what. John 21 verse 7, it gives us a picture of Peter's response to grace. So it says, then the disciple who Jesus loved, this is John referring to himself, said to Peter, it's the Lord. Look, it's the Lord on the shore. And as soon as Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he, he jumped in the water fully clothed and began to swim. Now, how many of you guys have ever been in like a car or a situation where you pull up next to somebody or you drive by somebody or you're around somebody that you don't want to see? Because maybe there's some awkwardness. How many of you guys ever just like lay back in the seat? Anybody ever do that? Or you like duck down like, no, 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 no they can't see me. Or maybe in the church lobby, you don't ever do this because we're a church. So you're like, I'm so, i got to go to the bathroom. I don't want to see that person. <laughs> I don't want to talk to them. Or maybe in a public space and you see that person first and they see you and you're like, no, don't tell them I'm here. Tell them I'm gone. Or maybe they call you or, you know, or something like that and you're like, decline. <laughs> I can't do that right now. You see, I, I, I like to think if I were Peter and I'm in the boat and I had just denied Jesus three times and then Jesus shows up, I wonder if my guilt would cause me to duck in the boat like, oh, don't, don't tell him I'm here. I don't, I don't want him to know. But Peter doesn't do that. He jumps out of the boat fully clothed and runs to Jesus. And what does Jesus do? Come here, Peter. Let's eat together. Isn't it funny that Jesus doesn't even ask Peter to own up to his problems before Jesus is like, hey, let's eat together. Jesus doesn't go, no, you, 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 you sit on the outside. You can, you can have whatever's left over. But Jesus says, hey, come on, let's sit next to the fire. It's, it, Jesus doesn't even ask Peter to, to deal with the problems. Grace finds a way. And maybe you're here sitting here this morning. And you got balloons, you got guilt, you got shame, and you're thinking that Jesus doesn't want to have anything to do with you, but all Jesus is doing is saying, hey, let's sit and talk. Let's sit. 
You think Jesus is all about religious behavior. No, no, Jesus is all about a relationship with you. He wants to talk with you. Hey, let's get there. We'll deal with that. So grace always finds you. The other thing is grace gives you purpose. In um, John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17, Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Come on, y'all preach with me. How many times did Jesus deny Jesus, uh, Peter deny Jesus? That was, like, that was like three of you. Come on, let's get like 30 of you. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Right. Here's what that means. That the number of times that Peter failed was the number of times that Jesus could cover it. So let's just be generous. How many times have you guys failed in your life? Maybe 50 last week. Maybe 50. Can I tell you that Jesus doesn't just forgive you for 25 of them? He doesn't just forgive you for 35 of them? He doesn't say, listen, all I got is 45 this week. I'm sorry, I got a lot of sinners out there. I got to spread this around. And you know what? Like you haven't been on your best behavior. Maybe next week I'll cover the difference. But this week, no. Jesus says, no matter the number of failures, no matter how deep, no matter how far, can I tell you, grace will cover it. Come on, and that's the good news of Jesus. So total them up. Get your calculator out. Add them up. And Jesus will meet you every single time. I got you. I'll cover the bill. I'll deal with it. But I love that Jesus doesn't just stop with the forgiveness of sins. Jesus actually empowers him. And this is where believers get stuck. They think that all Jesus is good for is forgiving their sins when Jesus is going, no, there's actually a grace life, an empowered life, a purpose and meaning. It's not about just covering your sins. It's about empowering you to live the best life you can possibly live with Jesus. So Jesus says, do you love me? Yes, feed my lambs. Why are you giving me purpose? Jesus, I've denied you. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, take care of my sheep. No, Jesus, I can't take your sheep. Like I can't even, like I can't even, like follow you. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, Jesus, you know that I love you. You know, feed my sheep. Jesus, I don't, I can't feed your sheep. You don't understand. And I think we think that this is, over a matter of years, like, this is a matter of weeks. This is like two or three weeks from when Jesus denied and then Jesus is giving purpose? What? Some of us, we got to think, we got to sit in spiritual time out. Like spiritual time, like, okay, I screwed up. I messed up. Thank you for forgiveness. No, I got to sit over here. I got to pay my dues. Maybe Jesus can use me in five years. I use drugs. Boy, that's a big one. Ten years. I slid into girls' DMs, and I'm married. Oh, that's 15 years. Some of you guys are, I have no idea what that is. Ask somebody under 30. It's a thing. Trust me. See, I think this, that then when we come to Jesus with repentant hearts, Grace can not only find you, but grace can give you purpose immediately. And can I tell you that your greatest trial will become your greatest testimony because you can say, I am not a picture of perfection, but I am a picture of God's grace. And can I tell you that he will use you right where you're at. What is Jesus' most prized possession? His sheep, you and I. And yet Jesus trusts Peter with his most prized possession. That's what grace will do. Grace will find you. Grace will forgive you, and grace will give you purpose. Isn't it crazy that the denier becomes a declarer? What do you mean? The first message in the New Testament outside of Jesus was who? It was Peter. And it was just a few days after this interaction. And he stands publicly full of the Holy Spirit, and it's a simple message that Jesus is king, and 3,000 people give their heart to Jesus. Man, my first message, I think 3,000 people quit. The denier becomes the declarer. Can I tell you that's for your life? But the enemy wants to keep you between guilt and grace and going, I don't know that I can really be used by God. I'm too guilty. No, you're forgiven. Finally, last one. Grace transforms you. Like I said, that shame has a unique way of telling you that you'll always be a certain way. 
Have you guys ever experienced this? Maybe I've, I, I, I experienced this in my life. Where like even I'll be preparing a message. I try to lead a church. I try to like navigate all this stuff. And I just have like this accuser that tells me like, yo, man, man, you don't got that. You're a failure. You're not any good. Shame has this beautiful way of always telling us what we're not. Man, you know how many times you messed up in your life, Eric? Yeah, I do. I remember all of them. How many of you guys remember all of them? You think hard enough, you can definitely remember them. Shame has a way of like, okay, go try. Do the Christian thing for a little bit. Try it out. You see, Jesus said to Peter, feed my lambs. And he said again, take care of my sheep. And he said, feed my sheep. Peter was not a shepherd. Peter was a fisherman. If Jesus had asked him to make some nets and clean some fish and navigate a lake, Peter had been like, all right, I got that. I know how to do that. But Jesus asked Peter to be a shepherd. Jesus, (laughs) I don't know anything about sheep. I don't know how to feed them. I definitely don't know how to take care of them. All I know how to do is catch, not guard. All I know how to do is clean, not shear. What does sheep eat? I don't know. Here's what grace can do for you. It can take a person who has always been one way. I don't know how to I don't know how to live pure. I don't know how to go multiple days without needing a drink. I don't know know what life would be like without my medication. I don't know what life would be like if I don't, if I'm not in a relationship. i got to get in a relationship, relationship. I don't know what life would be like if I forgave them. I don't know what life would be like without my anger. I don't know what life would be like. I don't know know how to do that, Jesus. I don't know how to go there. But yet Jesus still asks us. Why? Because grace transforms you. Can I tell you, I stand before you as a man transformed by grace. And I'm going to tell you, go around. Talk to people in our church. Talk to people in our church who have been around for a while. They'll tell you, man, I was one way. But Jesus redeemed me, set me free, transformed me. (laughs) And you know what? Paul even confirms it. In fact, in Corinthians, he says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, is in grace, The new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Come on, I believe that's something y'all need to pray this week. Praying, God, the new has come. I am being transformed every single day. God, you are setting me free. You are redeeming me. Shame has no hold on me. It is only grace. And can I tell you that God has a purpose and a meaning. And he's asking you, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, and feed my sheep. And grace will help you do it. Your home, your workplace, your neighborhood, your friends, your family, your followers on Facebook, can I tell you, feed them, take care of them. Let grace speak through you. Stop living in the in-between of feeling guilty and halfway grace-filled. But be in Jesus.